this is where we start looking into the eye of God. And so this is the most important thing. So let's pray one more time and just really give ourselves to the Lord to sit at his feet and learn. Father, we truly seek your face together. And we want to hear what you have to say to us. So would you come and speak to our hearts? Would you open our hearts? Would you, Lord, would you just scale down the hardness that's there and the hurts that have that so deeply penetrated us? We, it's hard for us to hear you now. It's hard for us to trust again. It's hard for us to um, let your spirit have a full path to our hearts. And, and we just pray you just take new ground in us tonight that we become more yours than we have been in years and years, that we could hear from you in such a personal way. We'd walk away knowing, wow, I've, I've touched the face of God. And Father, I am confident that you will be here ministering to us. You've made a promise that when we gather in your name, that you are in the midst, that you, you arrive, you show up, you speak, you instruct, you guide, you heal, you mend, you give life, you convict, you give hope, and we, we just cry out to you for those things. And we cry out for one another to receive those things, that you'd be glorified. And so take hold of this study for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Open up those Bibles. I so encourage you to go back if you missed our first chapter of uh, First John to watch that on the video. Um, there's some juicy nuggets in there uh, that you would not want to miss, but we're just going to go zooming right into chapter two. This is the only chapter um, in the book of First John that we're, we're splitting in half. So we're going to be doing about the first 14 verses. All right, First John chapter two, I'm going to read verses one and two. My little children... These things I write to you that, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. John is now long in years. He's, he's older he started the ministry as a young guy, and now he's advancing in years. And I love his approach throughout this entire letter. I mentioned it last week. It's just, he has such a manner and tone of genuine love and fatherly care over the church that's going to receive this letter. But I also believe that the same tone is the tone that the Holy Spirit wants us to receive it in, too. That same love, that same fatherly care, because we have a Father who loves us. Now, John understands that genuine love is necessary to minister this message that God has given him. Um, it's important that genuine love is the approach and the motive in which he brings it to us. Um, and it's really awesome because you could see that the love of Christ compelled him. It gripped him in order to bring about the message, the very message God had. And it's true, isn't it, that real love will discipline and real love will correct, real love will warn, real love will speak the truth, real love will challenge others to be the best and highest in Christ. Isn't that true? That's real love. John appeals to them with real love, just as the Heavenly Father appeals to us right now. He says, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. All that John had warned them of in chapter 1 and all that John will warn them of in the rest of this book, he, he writes for one purpose, that they may not sin. Sin, what's a simple definition of sin? Just right from the Greek, it means to err, to miss the mark. And that picture is the bullseye where you're taking your arrow and you're flinging it back and you're aiming just for that center part but you miss. <laughs> oh, man, I'm to the left of it. And that's the way sin looks. When God is perfect and we are to the left or to the right of that mark, we're off, right? We've missed the mark. And then another great definition for sin is also to wander from the path of righteousness. So John wants to warn them 
everything he's writing is so that you will not sin, you will not wander from the path, that you will not miss the mark. So that is his aim in this letter. When, when we want to warn someone uh, uh, so that they're not injured or hurt or fall into a, a mistake, you know, we also post po signposts and, uh, and warning labels and uh, with our government not wanting any lawsuits and so forth, companies as well. There's a lot of them. <laughs> they freely give us warnings uh, really to cover their own uh, neck. But what's great about you know, John's warnings, they really are for our benefit. God's warnings are for our benefit. They're not really just to save themselves. They're for us. What are some of the warning labels uh, that we have out there? I'm going to give you some, ex some examples right now. A microwave oven box had a warning that said, do not use for drying pets. Thank you for that one. <laughs> it was such a temptation. <laughs> And then there's a danger label on a chainsaw. These are real, <laughs> actual uh, warning labels. Do not hold the wrong end of the chainsaw. Yeah, that's a good one. And then on the packaging on a, a, an iron for ironing clothes, it says, do not iron clothes on body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will give you the tip of the day, and that is sometimes I use my curling iron, you know, to once in a while just to do a little pressing on an article of clothing. I've done it, and it has worked. <laughs> so, you know, you're not supposed to, but I've done it. How about this one? A Nitol sleeping aid product said may cause drowsiness. <laughs> really? <laughs> A blowtorch that says contents may catch fire. And then at the zoo, there was a sign. It, this is a true sign. It says, please be safe. Do not stand, sit, climb, or lean on zoo fences. If you fall, animals could eat you, and that might make them sick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the love in that one, right? <laughs> Those zoo people love their animals. And then lastly, on the scrubbing bubbles, Fresh brush, do not use for personal hygiene. So there you go. <laughs> it's a good thing we have warnings because they keep us safe, don't they? They really guard us, you know, and protect us. And so Paul's like, I want to guard and protect you. I want to keep you from falling in sin, wandering off the path, path missing the mark. So I write these things to you. Um, he really wants to keep the church from being driven off into paths of erroneous theologies because there were these, these heresies being taught to the Christians of that day and it was very confusing and some of them were being lured away by them. And so he wants to warn them, but he also wants to stiffen his readers against sinning, you know, so that they understand, look, sin is not good. I want you to resist the temptation to sin. So we'll look at that later in our study. But we do sin, right? We do sin. We do get dirty. We do wander and drift. We do fall short. But we have this encouragement in verse 1. It says, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but for the whole world. So I want you to imagine yourself in the highest court of the land, I don't know if any of you have ever been to court before for any reason. I, I've been to court to, you know, go through the jury duty process and have to sit in there. You know, you can't chew your gum. You're not supposed to be doing a bunch of whispering. You just got to sit there. You can't be playing Facebook or anything else. You have to sit there for hours on end. And it's a, even just for that, it's a bit kind of a stricter atmosphere. Then uh, one time I went to court with my friend who was going through an adoption process. And I mean, it was serious. There's no clowning around in that court. You behave, you sit up, you know, you listen and you keep your mouth closed. It's very strict. Now, and have any of you been to court? I don't want to know why, but have you visited court? <laughs> but do you know what I'm saying? How it's, it can be intimidating. It really gets, it's serious. The tone and the atmosphere, although you, once in a while you've got a judge who might crack a little joke or a smile, it is very serious tone. Imagine yourself in the highest court of the land because you're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty of breaking the law. Your sin condemns you. Your conscience condemns you. Well, Satan, of course, condemns you. <laughs> 
but the word of God also condemns you. God is the judge. God the Father is presiding. He's a judge who hates sin. You know there's hard judges, they say, and there's more liberal judges, right? This is a God who hates sin and who is going to, is going to you know, punish sin in the fullest degree because of his righteous anger. It's a frightening sen- sen- scenario to really imagine coming before a holy God knowing you are guilty as sin. But you have wisely chosen You have wisely selected an advocate, a lawyer, to stand by your side. And really, the case hinges on them. It hinges on their argument for you. It hinges on how they represent you. It's only going to go two ways. It's going to go freedom or prison. And for us, spiritually, it's heaven or hell. This is serious business. And so... Jesus, your advocate, goes before the judge, his father. It really kind of works out nice, huh? Like, hey, (laughs) that's his kid, brings a little favor in for you. You're like, yes, I got the right guy here. He's related. (laughs) And so Jesus comes to the judge, his father, and and says, um, you know, Father, I know she is a sinner. I know she is guilty. But she has confessed, and she has repented, and my blood has cleansed her. She belongs to me. On what basis would the judge even listen to that? On what basis would the judge clear your name just because he's saying that? Because he himself is our propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation, can you say it? Propitiation. That's a big one. (laughs) It's one of the whoppers in the Bible, and it's not used too often, but it's super, super important that we understand this role that Jesus plays for us. Jesus is the propitiation. It means that he, through his shed blood, and our faith in him and his shed blood, turns away the righteous wrath of God. His life on the cross, his role, his death on the cross, is a sacrificial offering. And by that, he pays in full the price or penalty for your sin. She's mine. She belongs to me. I've cleansed her. She's clean, Father. And that that death on the cross, that shed blood, satisfies the offended holiness of God. On these grounds, and these grounds alone, ladies, Christ claims your acquittal. You're free. You're not condemned. Your sins are forgiven. There is no record of wrong for you. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? It's miraculous and it's beautiful. And that's what Christ has done for the entire world. Every man, woman, and child that will ever come into this this world, be born into this world, has that offered to them. It's for them, whether they receive it or reject it. It's been accomplished for them. But when you believe, put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you are forgiven. And that is the the theology of propitiation. And it's a beautiful one. The accused, if they had no advocate, if they had no one to come alongside and, and fight for them to defend them, and it had to be a righteous one who had never, 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 never sinned, there would be no hope for this world. There'd be no hope for you or me. Every lawbreaker would necessarily be punished to the full extent of the law. But Romans 4, 7, and 8, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the woman to whom the Lord shall not lay responsibility or blame for sin. That's the work of the cross. We will sin. Yeah, we, we want to stiffen against sin. We want to fight against We want to resist it. We want to yield to the Lord and resist sin. But if we do, we have an advocate. 
And Jesus, who died for us, will forgive us of our sin. John 3, or 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. Let's read that. 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Did you notice the word know used in these uh, verses? There's three verses here. It's used four times. No, 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 no. We know that we know him. We know that we know him. Now, this word know is a very specific kind of knowledge. It's not a hearsay, something I've heard and learned from someone else. It's not something, it's not the kind of knowing that you get from a casual relationship with someone. It's actually the kind of know, uh, knowledge uh, that's grounded in personal experiences. Grounded in personal experiences. We know that we know him when we keep his commandments. I think we can grasp that. When we spend a lot of time with someone, when we're hanging out in all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of places, all kinds of s different situations, we really get to know them. <laughs> we really get to know their triggers, <laughs> what irritates them, what bugs them. They always let us know anyway, so of course we know. <laughs> and what pleases them, what, what just... Uh, What's their passion? What delights them? We learn what puts a smile on their face. We've spent time with them. I mean, when you spend enough time with someone, you pretty much can finish their sentences. And that's that kind of experiential knowledge that this passage is talking about. And so it's saying the knowledge um, that we, the time we spend with God, the more we do, knowledge in, in an experiential way occurs. It develops over time. Now, John says that the only surefire proof way of knowing that you know God is through obeying the commandments. That is so crazy because would we think that to ourselves that how do I know that person loves the Lord? How do I know they're a genuine Christian? How do I know that they run deep in their relationship with him? I usually wouldn't say it's because I, they keep the commandments. <laughs> They're obedient to God's word. They do what it says. They live it. I might not think that. Sometimes it's more like how they carry themselves, the way they pray, those elaborate, beautiful prayers, you know, the, the kindness of their, their words and their voice. And those are all great things. But he's saying, no, I'm going to tell you how you can identify who has a deep relationship with God, who's love toward God is perfected. In other words, their love is real and it's deep. It's the one who keeps God's commands. Now, that word keeping um, is a, it's a neat word and there's a lot of great synonyms for it. So I'm going to give you some of the synonyms. Verse 5 says, but whoever keeps God's word, whoever obeys, conforms, submits, adheres, complies, aligns, yields, and surrenders. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. The one who obeys God's words, who conforms to it, they read God's word, and it's like, that's what my life should look like. It doesn't look like that right now. I'm living this way. I have this pattern, this habit, this lifestyle. This is not what the word of God says. That has to change. I'm going to mold myself to that, what God's word says. And I'm going to leave behind what I was living before because I am conforming to it. I'm submitting to it. I'm saying, God has said it. He's my authority. Now I'm going to come under him and obey. I'm going to do it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to align myself with it. I'm not going to be a little to the right. I'm not going to be a little to the left. I'm going to take his word seriously and align my heart to his. It's a lot of work <laughs> to get two minds to see things the same, isn't it? Anybody married knows, right? Anybody who has a boss <laughs> knows. You know, you, all you have to do is have a relationship. It's even true with our kids. We can't get them to align with us. <laughs> 
It's a lot of work to get two minds to agree. The Lord doesn't need to agree with you, I just want to say. He never needs to agree with me. It is us who has to align to his word, his truth, what he says. We've got to do the moving. We've got to do the changing. We've got to do the conforming. And if you do, the evidence is that you love God. When a woman or a man enters the military, what a life change that is. I mean, I don't even have the guts to consider <laughs> such a thing. I'm just way too wimpy. The military has an expectation of complete conformity. Complete conformity. In every way that service tells you to conform, you must obey and adhere to it. You will be on time. You will dress the way they tell you to dress. You will say, yes, sir. You will go down for 50, <laughs> even if it kills you. You will respect those who are in command. And there's a lot of reasons people go into the military. There's, there's a lot of reasons to subject themselves to this intensity, it, right? Some of them, it's just a paycheck. I, I, I need to move advance in my life. I, I'm not sure what to do. I'm going into the military. I, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm starting a career. Some, it's the sense of support to our nation, to our country. That, that's a real, a real sense of duty to them. Others have a hope of furthering their career. Well, I'm going to start off here, but my goal is one day to be this, and the military is going to help me, and they're going to help finance that because I'm serving there. Others, their compliance and their conformity is just out of sheer terror <laughs> because it can be frightening to have one of these guys in your face. You will do what they tell you to do because the fear of punishment. But for the Christian, obedience, it begins with one thing, true knowledge of God. We talked a lot about that last week, of knowing that God is light, absolute perfection, perfect holiness, every bit of his morality which we're trying to copy is perfection there's no error there's no flaw we can count on god he doesn't change and with christianity when it comes to conforming to god's word and it comes to aligning ourselves to him the way to do that is through knowledge right it's through knowing who he really is you can't know what puts a smile on my face unless you know me right you can't know it's going to tick me off unless you know me. It's knowledge. Where are you going to get that? Where are you going to get that knowledge? Thank you. You are right. God's word. This is the only safe place to go to get the knowledge of God and know who he really is. So knowledge will, is the very thing that will show us how to conform and what ways to change and, and what ways we're off in what ways we could be made right. It has it, it contains everything. So we so need to be in God's word. But there's only one motive to obey God and to conform and to align. It's very different than why you might go in the military. The right motive is love. It's love. And when you gain the knowledge of who God is, you know what happens? You fall in love. You can't not fall in love. Because he's amazing. He's perfect. He loves you like no one else. You can't help but fall in love because you will be so well loved. There's no other response. Verse 5 says, Truly the love of God is perfected in the one who obeys God's commands. So, you know, we can, you know, say, okay, I'm going to... Uh, you know, talk about Jesus. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. That's how I'm going to show that I love God. Maybe you're going to wear a cross. That's how people are going to know I love God. Or you're going to dress in Christian apparel. I got my husband a few Christian, you know, type t-shirts. Um, and he really enjoys those. Got those for Christmas. But then, you know, he really enjoyed the Darth Vader one too. So, you know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what that means about him. I'm just saying. <laughs> You could wear that. You could post fuzzy, warm, loving quotations about Jesus on Facebook, but none of those things really prove you love God. 
that's not it. God has set a standard. And he said, your love for me is perfected in your obedience to my word. It's when you submit to me, when you study and you learn of me in true knowledge, and then you come under and do what my word has said. In verse 6, he says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also walk just as he walked. So when we're walking with God, when we've made our home in him, we abide in him, then we ought to walk as Christ has walked. We could be like him. We're going to mimic him. We're going to let him be our role model and then act and do as he did. He was holy. He was righteous. He was moral. He was ethical. He was kind. He was generous. He was loving. He died to himself like nobody's business. And we are to walk as he did. And as we walk like Christ, then we're distinguished from this world. Look, the world isn't getting any lighter. Uh, the world can say it is, but it's not getting any lighter out there. My goodness, if we're walking with the Lord, we should stand out like sore thumbs, like that chick has got to be one of those Christians. <laughs> She's just way too sweet. She's way too kind and loving. She always goes out of her way. We should be able to stand out in this dark world that we are a different people, that we have marks and brands that are the same that Christ carried while he was on this earth. We should have those same brands upon us. Jesus, when he was here, remember, we, we talked about last week that he was the God-man. He was fully God and he was fully man when he came here and was incarnate, right? Well, when he was here, he submitted to the Father, and he conformed to the Father's will. Even at the most difficult moments, when he was a man, and he said, oh, I don't want to die this death. Can this cup pass from me? He struggled. He knew what was about to happen, and it was all he could bear. And yet, what did he say, ladies? Not my will, but thy will be done. Do we see that he conformed to the will of God? He did what his father wanted him to do. He obeyed. And so we're called to do that as well. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, Leviticus eleven forty-five, God speaks to the Israelites and he's, he had literally just brought them out of Egypt where they had been slaves for years. Why were they slaves? What would happen to them? Why were they held captive there as slaves? Because they began worshiping the idols of the neighboring areas. And they made those idols their God. And God said, you want them? Have them. And, and so he allowed them to be held captive until their hearts broke and wanted their real God again. And so when they began to cry out to God, God sent a deliverer to them. And this is what he said to them. God said to the Israelites, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy as I am holy. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, not so you can go back to worship more idols. No, not that you can go back to sin in the ways you sinned before, but so that I could be your God. That's why I delivered you. And ladies, it's the same for us. God didn't deliver us out of this world, out of the clutches of Satan, for us to go back and let other things be our God. He delivered us out of that so we could make him our God. And when we do, we need to be holy as he is holy. We've got, being holy means to be consecrated. It means to be set apart. It means being in this world, but not being of it, not being like it, not conforming to them, but conforming to our Father. So he hasn't delivered you out of darkness um, so that you could go back to darkness, but so that you could walk in his light. 1 Peter 1.5 repeats Leviticus 11.45. It says, But he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. All your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. David Gusick wrote this. Mark it. When one becomes a Christian, there is a change in her relationship with sin. 
Sin is not eliminated in the believer until he comes to glory, but his relationship to sin or hers is changed when she truly becomes a Christian. A Christian no longer loves her sin as she once did. A Christian no longer brags about her sin as she once did. A Christian no longer plans to sin as she once did. A Christian no longer fondly remembers her sin as she once did. And a Christian never fully enjoys her sin as she once did. And lastly, a Christian no longer is comfortable in habitual sin as she once was. When we become a Christian, our attitude towards sin changes. And we know deep in our heart it's bad, right? That it's something to stay away from. It's, it's forbidden. And that sometimes touching that forbidden thing can cause so much chaos in our life. That's why we're warned. Because God wants the best for you. He's not withholding one good thing from you when he says, don't do it. Don't touch it. Don't be there. Don't hang with that person. Let that go. Die to it. <laughs> you know, drop it! <laughs> He's not doing that because he's selfish and he was withholding something that would be so good for you. If it's so good for you, then you've got it. And we learned that because he is light and perfection and he would put it into your hand. If he's withholding it right now, it's not the best thing for you at this moment. We've got to have a different view of sin. We don't hear about obedience that much. Thank God for the grace of God, <laughs> because that's where we're walking, in an unmerited favor. But yet God's saying, obey my commands. Look into my words and adhere to the things I'm telling you. Live like Christ lived. Live like I'm telling you to live. Change your attitude towards sin. I hate sin. You should hate sin. We're to be like him. Now let's go to 1 John and we're going to read verses 7 through 11. It's a nice chunk right here. 7 through 11. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the, or which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now right off the bat in this passage, there's an apparent contradiction it seems like there's a contradiction because he says in verse 7 i write no new commandment <laughs> but then in verse 8 he says a new commandment i write to you and you're like what <laughs> uh, john you always keep my head spinning but truthfully john when he speaks of the new commandment i write to you is quoting from his gospel he's quoting from john 13 34 and this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So you see, it's not a new commandment because it's something Jesus spoke while he was on earth. Okay, so he's saying, I'm not sharing with you a new commandment, but remember the, the, the new commandment that Christ gave us? It was a new way to love. It was a love beyond the way the world ever loved before. Remember, he wants the highest and best for us. And so he was saying, I'm going to teach you a new way to love. In the Greek, there's many words for love. You know, I could tell you that I love a good cheeseburger and I love my husband. And you would go, okay, some things not like, really you love the same, you know? <laughs> well, in our English language, it, it doesn't make the difference so much. Um, and I really do love a cheeseburger. <laughs> but in the Greek, it's awesome because they, they have so many more words and, and things are so much, you know, well-defined compared to the English language. There was an Eros love. 
this is the sexual love, that, that, that kind of driving force of love, uh, more physical than anything else. But of course, this is not the love that <laughs> John is telling us to have for one another. It's not phileo love. Phileo love is what they call like a spontaneous natural affection. It's kind of more feeling than it is reason, kind of like when you get that crush on someone and, you know, your eyes are all glittery and you just, all you could see is that they seem so perfect. You're still in that little, you know, crush period. Um, also, it can be considered a brotherly love or a friendship type of love. But that's not the kind of love John is asking us to have. It's something better. It's not storge love. Storge is a natural affection between family members. You love your children. You love your, your parents, you know. You love your uncles and aunts. You, you love your husband. It's, it's natural. It's something that's, you know, that just comes natural to us. The love that he is calling us to have for one another is a love called agape love. Agape love. It's the highest form of love that there is. And it's, it's distinguished in a very unique way, not the way we might think. Because I think we, when we think of love, we think of really good feelings inside, right? And, and this sort of affection, that is part of the love we're supposed to have for, for each other. But there, it's something deeper. And I have to say that it's something harder for us in our flesh. Agape love is a kind of love that places others in the highest regard and esteem. And I want you to note that he's speaking about having this love in the, with the brethren, with our family in Christ. He's telling us to love one another as, as believers. This is not, he's not talking to us about how we love the world right now. He's saying, I want to talk to you about how you love each other in the church, how you love each other as a body in Christ. And so he says, I want you to agape one another. And a passage that really, uh, I think, uh, highlights what that kind of love is like is Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself, and let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Agape love is a self-sacrificing love. And it's a love that cares for the interests of others before its own. It's a strong determination to seek others' highest good in all circumstances. To seek others' highest good in all circumstances. And this was the mind that was in Christ Jesus that we're being called to emulate, that we're being called to live out with one another at all cost. Every Christian has the ability to love this way. Everyone is able to love this way for one reason. Christ lives in you. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh or in my human body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ lives in us. He is the power and the ability to walk in an amazing, beautiful love for others. If we're not walking in that love, it's because we are not crucified to Christ. We're living and we're letting our flesh lead, and we're letting it have its way. And we're not saying no to the flesh, but mainly we're not saying yes to Christ. Live in me, dwell in me, have your way in me. Fill me with that love. It's right there. His love can crowd out all hate, all hurt, all offenses, all shames, all judgments. Whatever has been done to you that, that makes you think, I can't love that person. They don't act like a Christian. You know, if they don't quack like a duck and they don't walk like a duck, they must not be a duck. So therefore, I'm not going to love them. <laughs> Your brothers and sisters in the Lord are sinners. Hello? They're not going to do it perfectly, and neither are you. But nonetheless, if you want Christ's love perfected in you, if you want to be an awesome Christian, do you want that? Do you want to be an awesome Christian shining for 
of the Lord giving him glory? You've got to love the brethren. You've got to love his people. Do you understand that if you're harboring hate against a, a believer, that you're harboring hate against one of his children? How do you feel when someone hates one of your children or your family members? You want to box their ears in, right? It hurts the heart of God when we hate one another. And I think it's so interesting in the passage because in verse 11, I'm going to read it. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know that he is where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. That, that brother that's in darkness because of hate, they can't see what they're doing. Whatever they're doing, however they're managing their life, they are off. A blind person cannot walk a straight, righteous path. Hate brings blindness, and it makes us act out in ways that are just ungodly. We've got to deal with the hate issues. But I just think it's so interesting that in this passage, he's talking about two things that are contrary to one another, right? Love and hate. But I think most of us would say, I don't hate anyone. <laughs> I'm in the middle of that. I, don't, I might not love them, but I don't hate them. Girls, there's only love and hate. Which is it? <laughs> don't fool yourself. If you have an ought against, or the, boy, I'm going old King James on you. <laughs> if you have an issue against a brother or a sister in Christ, if you haven't forgiven them, if you're saying, I can't stand them, I don't want to serve with them, I don't want to be friends with them, I'm holding back in some way with them, then you're not in God's love. And his love cannot be perfected in you. It's that hate has got to be removed. He's in you. All you got to do is say, remove it. I want it gone. I want it abolished. I, I want complete forgiveness. I don't want to judge him. I don't want to, you don't hold records of my wrong when I confess my sin. I want to love like you do because that's the highest love. He says, this is how I want you to love him. The way I love you. Not the way they love you. That would be so much easier. <laughs> they don't really like me anyway. That's why I'm not really friends with them. They never liked me. I can feel it. <laughs> and so we, we feel like we usually feel that we have a good reason to have hate or an issue with someone. But it's love or hate. Don't fool yourself. If you know that you don't love them, then you've got to get with God until you do. Because he does. And he will win you over for them because he deeply loves them with every flaw, with every wart, with every attitude. Now, does that mean you will be blinded to their flaws and their warts and their attitudes? No. I mean, we're not, we're not going to be blind. We can see that they're imperfect, but we choose to love them the way Christ does. We think of their best interest. We esteem them as more important than ourselves. We do anything we can to put them in the best position they can be so they can have the most awesome walk, they can have the most awesome life. We have to die to self to do that. Because when we say, I choose this hate, I choose a wall instead of a bridge to that person, then we have literally said, I don't get God. Or I reject him. And I know no one wants to do that. I know you want Christ to have free-flowing access to you. I know you want him to come in and fill you up with his love. And so he's calling you to that. He's calling you to ask him. Let me get this back on my ear. It's so time, you know, not to quit blaming and being harsh and critical on others. Just know they got to walk their walk. They've got to let God move them along. But what about you? This is your walk. You get to choose how you're going to walk it. Let them choose how they're going to walk it. But love God perfectly. Obey his command. What is his command? Love one another as I have loved you. I was just telling Selena, you know, uh, Selena, you, you haven't uh, wanted to be crucified for me. You don't love me that much. <laughs> I mean, I know you love me, but it only goes so far, doesn't it? You know? And I've told her, she's like, you better believe that. <laughs> it only goes so far. God is not asking us to die on a cross, but he's asking us to die to ourselves, humble ourselves, 
lay our life down and love that person like nobody's business. You know, sometimes I think that it's better to go for it. Like, that's it. I'm, this is over. I'm going to love that person and love them. Love them full out. Give. Be generous. Pray for them. Pray for them. Oh, God bless them. Pour your blessings abundantly on them. Be careful of going over all their issues with God because sometimes that can build up yours again. Bless them. Help them to know you. Help them to walk in your will. Provide for them and show me how I can be a blessing to them. Get involved with them by prayer. Your heart's going to turn. It's going to change. You're going to become their friend before they know it because you're going to be invested in their life. That's what Christ did. That's what he did for us. That's what he wants us to do for one another. He's calling us to love. Don't hinder the testimony of the church by not loving your brothers and sisters. They're looking at us and saying, man, those Christians, <laughs> they really know how to pour salt on the wound. As soon as one of our Christians stumble or fail, Oh, the church attacks them. What about building them up? What about lifting up? There's hope for our brothers and sisters. Christ is going to run after them to restore them, to heal them, to mend them. He's going to call on them to repent. Trust me, he will. And those people need our support, not our condemnation. Let's show the world that we're together in this, that we love and that we care for one another. And there's nothing like receiving it, is it? It's a wonderful thing when the body of Christ loves you just the way you are wrinkles and hairs and <laughs> something stuck between your teeth and they love you let's be that kind of family for one another just as christ is telling us you know john himself was not perfect at this when he began with christ he and his brother james were nicknamed the sons of thunder <laughs> Because they had big personalities. They were very impetuous in, in uh, their reactions to things. And at one point, Jesus took his disciples with him to a Samaritan village. Samaritans are Gentiles, and they were hated by the Jews. The Jews snubbed them because they kind of mingled their religion between Judaism and other you know, weird secular beliefs. And so that they, they hated them. So Jesus brought them into the Samaritan village and the Samaritans rejected Jesus. They wanted nothing to do with them. So James and John, when they saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, you want us to call down fire on them? Oh, they were so ready to use any spiritual weapon against them. So quick. Let's, you know, fire on them. There's no hope for them then, is there? That's how we can often be. But that was John when he was younger in the Lord. That's his impulsiveness. That was his attitude. It took years of walking with the Lord, and he grew into a man of absolute grace and love. Don't we want to grow there too? Seriously, consider, is there anybody that you need to get this hate out of the way and turn it back into love? It's just a matter often of pride. It's an, uh, something that we feel is so uncomfortable, but God is saying, please, let me love through you. Let me crowd out your hate. And fill you with love. Now, 1 John uh, verses 12 through 14 is a little bit different, and it's written differently than the rest of this chapter. He breaks uh, up his message into three categories Ch little children, young men, and fathers. And some have suggested that the divisions, as he's speaking and writing to them, uh, that he's considering the chronological age of Christians in the church. Others say that he's dividing it up based on spiritual maturity. And I can just tell you that I'm really not sure <laughs> which it is. I mean, I'm not. I am not 100% sure at all what it is. I know one thing. I know that you could be young in the Lord and you could be strong in the Lord. You could be old in the Lord and be very weak because you have not walked out your faith. So that chronological age doesn't necessarily mean much. It's our spiritual age that matters. So I just want to share some words kind of with that in mind. And I'm going to keep the little children together and the young men portion together and the fathers together. So verse 12 says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. Verse 13, I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. 
John uses two different words for little children in each of those verses. Verse 12, he uses tikneon, and in verse 13, he uses paideon. Of course, you know, I can't speak Greek, so what do you want? That's the best I can do. <laughs> Tikne Tignion has more of an emphasis on a child's relationship of dependence on a parent, where uh, Pideon has more of an emphasis on a child's immaturity and need for instruction. Little children, I write uh, because it says, I write to you because your sins are forgiven and because you have known the Father. This place, little children, that's the beginning for every Christian, isn't it? That's where we begin. We, no one comes out as an adult <laughs> in the Lord. We begin as little children at our new birth. And little children in the Lord are excited about one thing. Their sins are forgiven. That's the one thing they know. My sins are forgiven. I don't have the weight and the shame and the guilt hanging over me anymore. And it's such an exciting time when you first receive Christ. I was just a little girl. I was only six. But when they said, you know, you're a sinner, and that means your heart is black, I knew it was true. I could raise my hand and said, yes, I want Jesus in my heart. And when he came in at six years old, I can tell you I felt light. I remember it going, I felt different inside. I could feel like my sins were gone, like I felt light and float. I floated back home. I couldn't wait to tell my mom. Our sins are forgiven. It's the greatest joy of our new birth. Now, sure, we don't know the Father that well yet. We're just in the beginning of our walk. We don't have that depth of experience that the older Christians have. We haven't mastered consistency in feeding ourselves. Maybe we're not even feeding ourselves yet at the beginning. We just need to be fed, right? We need someone to come along and help us eat the word of God, understand the word of God. We need people that are older to do that for us. But there's nothing to be ashamed of, right? Because you're just, you're a baby. You're a little child in the Lord. We're never upset with our children when they're first learning to eat. What's the matter with you? Why can't you use spoon already? <laughs> No, because we know it takes time, right, to master these skills. And so that little, that little time where you're just learning about the Lord and who he is in your life. You know your sins are forgiven, but you don't know that much yet. You're dependent completely on being taken care of by him. And he has such special grace on new believers to help them in their walk. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so, we are little children in the Lord for some time, but there has to come a time when we put away childish things, right? There has to come that time when we begin to mature and take on the qualities um, of what would be the work of the young men. We never want to find ourselves stuck as little children and have years go by. And I've been a Christian 15 years, but we are still like a little child. We can't feed ourselves. We don't know how to navigate a spiritual walk. We don't know how to fight spiritually. We don't want to stay there. We want to go further. And so then he talks to the young men. Verse 13, he says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Verse 14 says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Young men in the Lord, spiritually speaking, are, they have a warrior's mentality. They are excited about the things of God and they want to be part of it. They want to be in on it. They're serious about walking with God and battling darkness in the present age they live in. And their personal walks for God, and their, their service for the Lord, that's that time when you're a young man where it begins to soar. You're not a baby. You're not being fed. You're feeding yourself now. You're not on the sidelines. You're getting involved. You're active for the Lord. You've made him, you know, you've made yourself available to him and however he would call you to serve. And it talks about the fact that the young men have overcome the wicked one. It says how they've done that because they abide in God's word. It has made them strong. 
when you become that young man, you understand the spiritual realm more. You understand what the devil is up to, and you understand how to fight against that, don't you? You understand now. You may not understand at all because you're not a father yet, <laughs> but you want to get involved, and you want to push back the darkness, and you want to bring Christ-like light everywhere you go. And so that mentality of being a young man, it's just an exciting time when you're just you know, wanting to give your all to the Lord, and you're just truly uh, surrendering your life. I remember being younger in the Lord and hearing speakers. They would, uh, you know, always just inspire me so much to want to be more in Christ. And I remember the, the woman who spoke with our women's retreat and said, you know, who do you want to be in the Lord? Actually, it was, it was Sharon Reese, I remember. It was Sharon Reese. You know, who do you want to be in the Lord, ladies? You want to be a VW? You want to be a Mack truck? I don't know what to tell you, but all I can say is Mack truck inside. I am like, I want to be a Mack truck. I mean it. I'm from my mouth to your ears, God. I meant it for real. I want to be that in you. Sold out. Give it up. Live for you. I don't want to be on the sidelines. I want to be part of what you're doing, whatever that looks like or means for me. That was a real prayer. Boy, he hears those real prayers. <laughs> What about you? Do you want to stay a child? Are you ready to get in and fight? You've got to be in the word of God. If, it, if they were able to overcome the wicked one, you have to understand that they understood God's word enough to say, okay, the enemy is bo uh, uh, you know, bombarding my mind, but I know how to take my thoughts captive, and I know how to punish them in Christ. You understand? And I know that he, he has devices against me. And you're able to spot, he is just trying to get in the way of me being at Bible study, but I will not let that happen. And we overcome him through, through prayer, for, from you know, crying out to God. We overcome all the, the things of lust and, and selfishness and greed and the things of this world, those things of the devil, by yielding to the Lord and giving him more of ourself, more room to work in us. It's the best place to be. It's exciting times when you come to that place and say, I don't want to be a child. Move me in, Lord. But it's not going to happen unless you're in God's word, ladies. You need the knowledge of God in order to know how to walk with him this way. Now, these, these young men, you have to understand them. I mean, they're still rash. They're still not fully trained. They're lacking still some hands-on experience. But they put what they learn into action. They read it and they do it. They read it and they do it. They read it and they test God and go, wow, he was not lying. I can trust him. And they get the victory over the devil, over the wicked one. And they're, they're more fruitful and more diligent and more consistent in their studies. Can that be said of you? David Goose wrote this. The young men, they are engaged in battle with the wicked one. We don't send our little children out to war, and we don't send our old men to the front lines. The greatest effort, the greatest cost, and the greatest strength are expected of the young men. For this reason, many have sought to stay in spiritual childhood as long as possible. This is wrong. This is like being a draft dodger or a vagrant. We expect children to not fight in wars and to be supported by others, but we don't expect that of adults. Are you really supposed to be a young man, but you're still a, a child, a little one in the Lord? He's calling you up. And then fathers, verse 13, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And he repeats that in verse 14. You've known him from the beginning. The fathers represent the mature believer. That doesn't mean a perfect believer. <laughs> There's no such thing. But a mature believer, they're characterized by experiential knowledge of an eternal God. They know him in his depths. They've spent time in God's word, basking it, covering it, memorizing it, putting it to heart, then putting it to practice. They've had a trial in front of them they did god's word and they saw that god came through they're not on shaky ground like they were when they were young men <laughs> now they're standing strong 
They've been tried and tested in trials by God, by Satan, by this world. Yet they learned, they accepted the chastisement of God and the correction of God and were able to mature because of it. They know God's word. They know the God of the word. They have lived the word. And now the fathers or the mothers are able to be advisors and overseers to those who are coming up in their younger, less developed stage. Some of us here are mothers in the Lord. And we, we've had so much time in the word. We've been taught so well by amazing pastors. We've learned obedience. And, and others around us, excuse my runny nose right now, Others around us, they need our support. They need our discipleship. They need our encouragement. Because we've passed through these high waters and through these fires, and they're like, I have no, I'm drowning here. I'm, I'm going to catch fire. What am I going to do? They need you to show them that God is faithful, to talk to them, and encourage them, and pray them through. Are you that mother? Who are you helping? Who are you reaching out to? A baby can't do this on their own. They can't. God's calling on us to help them. A young, a young warrior still needs a lot of guidance. <laughs> Sometimes they'll head on into war where they don't belong. Who's going to say, no, 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 slow down here, slow down. <laughs> God wants to use us. So he's calling all of us, isn't he? This, these three categories, little children, young men, fathers, every one of them are Christians. Every one of them are born again by faith. Where are you at? Where would you say you are in your walk? Where you are in your faith? Are, are you moving ahead properly? Or have you been lagging behind? Cry out for it. If you want to grow, if you want to be all that he has for you, if you want his destiny for your life and not your own, which is, oh, his is so much better then cry out for it and say, okay, I'm, I'm all in. And I'm going to start by being in your word and taking you at your word and lining my conduct up to your word. I'm going to conform to you and I'm going to obey. George Mueller said, the vigor of our spiritual lives will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our lives and in our thoughts. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're willing to sit in this long Bible study and hear this long word, but I hope it encourages you. I hope it, it makes you want to pray a crazy prayer like I did. I want to be a mag truck. I don't want to settle for anything less, Lord. Because he wants to make us strong. He wants to make us strong in him. He wants to perfect our love for him. He wants to use us. He wants to do exploits through us. He wants us to shine like a light in a dark world. You ready to pray? Let's pray. I just so encourage you to pray right now yourself and just talk to God about what you've heard tonight. If there's one specific thing that you need to cover with him, let's just take a moment of quietness and let you do that. Give us ears to hear you. Give us hearts to obey you. Help us to align ourselves to what we heard tonight. Take us home, Lord, and keep talking to us. Keep strengthening us. Help us to yield. Help us to make your word important. Perfect our love for you. We pray. Lord, it's your love that God bless you guys. Enjoy your group time.